decided to call this a silky path unit and I, I guess what really I was trying to do was incorporate more rigor to a classic year seven topic. Uh, so I'm Richard. Um, I put Winchester, Winchester there because I was meant to put Hampshire. Um, so I work in a school in Winchester in Hampshire. Um, and we're currently going through a little bit, a uh, few changes which I'll talk about with um, the rationale. So some of our thoughts uh, before I started to plan this sort of unit. We're really planning key stage two at the moment. Um, my school, I've been there for two years now. We focus heavily on remodeling the GCSE. Um, when the department felt that that had been done quite successfully from 2016, um, I sort of arrived um, and decided I want to try and shake up as much as possible because 14th century somewhere I spent a lot of time as an undergrad. So my, um, I would say my special speciality is, is within medi late medieval history. Um, but not so special enough not to learn loads from uh, Claire's talk there, so that was um, fantastic. Um, I really do see the Black Death as an, as an important topic. Um, and so I we've been deliberating a, a different sort of year seven scheme of work approach. And we almost, I almost had a choice between the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War. Now, it really pained me to say I had to uh, just sort of hold the Hundred Years' War, not a uh, purely a curriculum choice based on time, um, but also our intent for history and for what we wanted the pupils to get out of it. Um, and that pain me to say it because that is that was the topic I did for my uh, dissertation. So I had to really, um, really sacrifice that. Um, and our current uh, scheme of work for the Black Death was very outdated. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about how I went about planning this particular unit. Um, as the Black Death I see is a very important topic, um, which undoubtedly comes from a lot of the reading I've done. And also because I'll argue that medieval history, despite being what potentially on the periphery of, of school curriculums and history, maybe that's just a personal thought, um, is just as important as a lot of the other history that we uh, teach our peoples. So in terms of where my inspiration comes from, um, uh, when we entered into lockdown, I had just finished a book and had a choice. I was looking at Silk Road and some other novels and thinking, wow, Silk Road is really big. If I don't start it now and read it now, I probably won't read it for another year. Um, so it was it's lockdown almost came a perfect time for me to give the Silk Road a go. And I'm so glad I did because it really gave me that perspective. Um, what Frank Panag uh, talks about is that map of the world he had when he was a child and how he wanted to explore all these different countries and regions of the world, sort of in the Middle East uh, and in Central Asia and Eastern Asia. That he never got to experience at school. Um, and he really does take you on that journey of exploring the, the history of this uh, amazing geographical region of the world. And ever since I finished it, all I wanted to do is incorporate more global silky history to Key Stage 3. In the, you can really get this idea of the silk Road of the world, sort of, um, sort of being the nervous system of the world, especially during the Middle Ages, and that's where my attention was drawn to. So yeah, the Silk Road really gave me that evidence-based approach. I sort of sidestepped the Black Death during my undergraduate study, so I didn't really come across the Black Death um, as a part of the curriculum until I started training, and I was I saw in um, various uh, schools approaching the Black Death in very different ways. And I can't help but feel that I, I left it feeling hollow. But anyway, the Silk Roads gave me a really good um, focus of which to look at it. Um, so this is a quote from the book. I probably should have referenced it. Um, I think it's about page 187 or so. But this is what Frank Van says. He says, from field to farm and city to village, the Black Death created hell on earth, putrid, rotting bodies, oozing with pus, set against a background of fear, anxiety, and disbelief at the scale of suffering. And yet, despite the horror it caused, the plague turned out to be the catalyst for social and economic change that far from marking the death of Europe, it served as its making. Now, I remember reading this chapter just thinking, wow, the imagery, his narrative was so good and the imagery was um, absolutely fantastic. And when I came back to the, the, the text, um, rereading about the Black Death, thinking about, right, so what sort of inquiry do I want? I wasn't really constrained with what sort of second order concepts I needed, but I'll come back to discuss that in a little bit. So I wasn't constrained by that. I was really only constrained by the amount of lessons I could do on it. But this, this quote really uh, popped out at me. And I really loved that argument of the catalyst for social and economic change. 
and it made me really think I don't really want to focus on um, the people in politics as much. I really want to do want to focus on uh, how did life change sort of, you know, from the very uh, the lowest levels um, up from there. So my rationale for teaching in uh, the Black Death uh, in this sort of way is that my medieval I, I sometimes think medieval history is sometimes not seen as serious. Now, that is a very personal experience. So some of you might be in schools where actually medieval history is um, taken very seriously. Um, but my experience before was as someone who loves the Med Middle Ages, um, has explored so much about it. Well, probably not as much as professional historians, but it's sometimes not seen as serious um, a topic, especially um, with it being taught in year seven with our um, the younger years studying it and actually I, w I really wanted to provide some rigor and serious disciplinary approach to history i think understanding catalysts for change is important for us today um so it's really important i think not only for um teaching the black death as innately important itself but to help pupils understand that actually things can change very quickly in our own lives as well uh, and make them perceptive and analyze the world they live in to show actually you know we can have we almost have black death moments in the modern world um and i hope next year we'll, i guess we'll have another five to five to eight years certainly of pupils who will definitely remember what it was like to live through lockdown and live through their own version of a pandemic um sometimes i think the black death can sometimes be whittled down to silly prevention so i put quote marks in uh silly you know I've seen lessons where pu pu uh, pupils have been asked to rank um, different forms of preventions from the most ridiculous to the most clever. And actually, I think that that really um, devalues the human experience of the people of the people of the Middle Ages, where actually we're not trying to show that these people were stupid, as, as Claire was saying. You know, these people just lived in a different time. Um, and I didn't like that idea that actually, you know, oh, these people are funny. They put frogs on on buboes and things like that. I really wanted to give them. I, I kind of so I tried to keep away from preventions and look purely at what like how life was changed both socially and economically. And I guess that uh, is that idea of invoking a more rigorous curriculum. So you'll see later how I try to incorporate as best I can uh, uh, evidential um, thinking as well as how does Frank Pan form his argument and show the discipline of the historian. And I really wanted to incorporate that global story of the Black Death. I think it needs telling. And that's why Frank Pan wrote his book. He, he wrote, he wanted to write a global history that's not Eurocentric. Uh, although a lot of the lessons do end up in Britain, um, I really do want to show that story of the Black Death coming across Asia. Um, and just the research, just reading about it has maybe real. Uh, well, it showed me how the Black Death was, or bubonic plague, maybe not called Black Death in all areas of the world, was affecting places like China in the 1350s as well, 1340s, and how actually we can sometimes think of it as a, you know, Europeans like almost grab onto anything they want to talk about as their own. Actually, Frank Pan's approach to looking at Egypt and uh, Arabia and the impact in Mecca, I just found it really just. Uh, filled out the whole story for me and I think that's what our pupils need he wrote the book to try and get us away from this Eurocentric idea of the past and I think we need to do that as well um, with different topics in a, a more in a more small scale so uh, as I was coming up this inquiry I really did having read that quote I really did want to focus on the idea of change um, now just in the latest edition of teaching history 179 the what's the wisdom on had a role in helping me change uh, form the change inquiry and it came and it really helped to focus me so i can't really claim a lot of the work um as original <laughs> i'm really basing this off uh, the brilliant histor uh, history community we have in this country um so it, it talks about well if you're going to form your change inquiry make sure it's got you've got the explicit focus so are you going to focus on the degree or the extent of change? So change versus a continuity. So as, as an example, how far did Anglo-Saxon England survive the Norman conquest? Okay, so degree and extent of change. The nature or type of change. So what kind of change was the Reformation? Or rate, pace, speed of change. And then I settled on the process of change. So I really wanted to look at um, 
how did this change occur? What, what, what did it really look like? What happened to the, uh, the society and economics of later medieval England? And really that process helped me to look at, well, how is Frankopan showing that process as well? However, I must be said that there were elements of rate, pace and speed of change within it based on the point that you're about to see. So I'd really recommend reading that What's the Wisdom on it. It was a brilliant segment. It really, really helped me to um, be much clearer in what I was wanting to do with my uh, inquiry on the Black Death. So here's what I came up with, which was how did the Black Death prove to be a catalyst for social and economic change? So I've, I've incorporated the quote because Peter Frankopan really does come along um, with us along the whole journey uh, throughout. So um, Ben Walsh was talking at the virtual, uh, virtual schools history project conference at the weekend about um, bringing in the historian into the classroom in a real, a real way and making sure that they're at the forefront. So. <laughs> I must say, I, I, I don't really think I teach this unit. It's more Peter Frankopan and his extracts. They really do the teaching um, of the unit. I can't really claim to really do that much exposition on this and dropping knowledge. It's more uh, pupils working through extracts and working along his arguments. So a um, couple of things I want to just pick out from this. So starting off with the how, one, it highlights that process that you've got there. Um, but also, it, I wanted to look at the process of history as well. So basically, what it's saying is, how has Frank Pan proved the Black Death to be a catalyst for social change? Because I can't really, I don't really think we can argue it wasn't. Um, so I must say, in previous years, I've I've asked people to say, um, I've asked people the question, did it even change anything? Well, of course it did. We can't. I don't think we can argue that the Black Death did not. And I think sometimes, we, um, uh, as I'm growing and maturing as a teacher, I'm, I'm realizing actually there's parts of my practice that in, I've done in previous years, actually looking back, it's allowed people to come away from a topic with the wrong conclusions and the wrong takeaways. So I really wanted them to look at the process of history. How does Frank Pan do this? It's, I wouldn't say it's an interpretation focus inquiry. I wanted to focus on change, um, but there is an incorporation of um, how he comes to this judgment. We're not gonna evaluate it in, in depth. We're not. I'm, don't like the idea of saying he's wrong because these are 11 and 12 year olds. But I really wanted to focus on that process of history. I love the word catalyst. Um, I think it's got brilliant uh, connotations that pupils can really think about. And using the quote, um, I think gets pupils engaged. And if you get them excited about reading uh, chapters or extracts from this amazing book, really set that to set the bar high for them then they will genuinely rise to it um, so what does this mean for changes to life um, I love that idea as dr as Claire was saying about you know there were there were some things that were going on before the black death that sort of is sped up um, so often I see in the research or in my research how um, not sure I mean I don't feel too uh, strongly well I'm not too keen on the word feudalism, but even before in the early 14th century, you have um, more sort of military professionalism developing within armies. So you get the reduction between land and labor, even in the early 14th century, but this sped up by the Black Death. So I love that idea about how can we get people to really think about what does a catalyst mean in the past? And I think really helps using the word catalyst and exploring it in year seven can help them to use it in their language and debates um, through later years. Growing, uh, going through uni, I, I tended to pick more political units, and then as I uh, grow older and wiser, I clearly um, prefer and more uh, love looking at a good social approach to history as well. Um, so a key focus on wide societies, so I think it, in my head it is a deliberate reason not to include uh, much on politics and what governments are doing, um, because I really do want to focus on what the impact is on the everyday people, because ultimately, what our pupils have most in common with people in the past is that they are not people in government. So who, who are they got most in common with? It's the, it's the wider social, uh, wider society, not those in charge. And the idea of change. Um, I wanted to make that specific focus as the second order concepts. Yeah, there is, a, as I said, there's a little bit of interpretation in there, but I really want the key takeaway to be how has the Black Death essentially changed? society and the economic institutions of Europe and of other places all across um, sort of linked to the Silk Road. So um, teaching, I'll just 
plug it out there again teaching history 178 has a great segment on creating inquiry questions as well um i've been doing a lot of reading about that recently trying to make sure that these inquiry questions are doing the right thing because otherwise I've, I've i guess we've all been in that position where we've got to the end of the unit and thought actually that didn't quite work so i've been trying to make sure that i've formu I spent time formulating this inquiry question so that it would indeed work so here's what i came up with i had about i mean in reality i had about three weeks and we have two le two lessons a week so i really had six lessons but i thought now nah, solid i'm going to push for seven because i think it's really important um so i've really sort of split mine and uh, split the inquiry sort of into three sort of segments i guess um so lessons one two and three are focusing on that what christine council has called a lot that hinterland knowledge so that really broad contextual knowledge so i have a whole lesson introducing what the silk roads were which I really enjoyed planning because um, basically we just get to read Frieda the Frank fans uh, book, which I really enjoyed. Um, and it's, it's almost purely contextual. So what the Silk Roads are uh, and the role they played in the Middle Ages, uh, using that as a, as a sort of like the cornerstone of what they're going to um, build on later. Um, then I bring in some sort of classic SHB work on where the Middle Ages will muck and misery. Um, this is sort of a reference point for the changes brought by the Black Death. Um, it's quite a common lesson type that I've seen in various departments that actually I think helps to provide contextual knowledge again. So that's why that they're sort of in those beigey colour. Um, and it helps pupils to understand uh, a little bit more about the people of the Middle Ages. It helps to get rid of misconceptions about are oh, they stupid because they're not, especially the one that they always think that they thought that the world was round, didn't. So I really like that as a way of sort of squashing those misconceptions and, and allowing all the different voices sort of of the Middle Ages uh, to talk. And then did so. And then I thought, well, hang on, they really good. They needed an idea about what medieval medicine was like, because otherwise I don't want to help. I don't want them to come away thinking, well, why can't they just use antibiotics or why can't they just take some sort of medicine? So it's a chance to include some medical history, which we do teach at GCSE. Uh, we teach the AQA. Uh, Britain Health and the People Unit. So, but I really do think the main the main idea of it is to reduce those misconceptions from the very beginning and say, well, actually, this is what their medical understanding was like to help them when we actually get to the Black Death arriving in Europe from about the mid 1340s, that they can't just go to a doctor and get any sort of form of antibiotics. So then the green ones, we really get to the core content, having you having built up their contextual knowledge. Um, now it's halfway through the unit, I feel like they're ready to really start looking at the role the Silk Road, Silk Road's played in the Black Death, the impact of the Black Death, and then um, the evidence for the Black Death, which I'll, I'll come to later. So um, we're using Frank Pan's, like his amazing narrative to show how the Black Death spreads. Now I'm considering what I, something I think would be really useful is considering we've got a medieval China unit. I'm considering editing that to include some Mongol expansion in the 13th century to make better sense of what the Mongols are doing near the Black Sea in the 1340s. Otherwise, these people rock up, besieging Kafir in 1346. And I feel like I'm a bit worried that when I come to teach this, because obviously I planned it in lockdown, when I come to teach this, people's going to be like, who are the Mongols? Well, they don't care. Um, so I'm considering other units as well to help build up their knowledge of the Black Death. And then once we've looked at how it spreads and we've sort of mapped the spread and looking how it um, comes to Europe and spreads throughout the uh, sort of Eurasia, I want to look at purely the impact. So I've used the work of Ian Dawson on the impact of the Black Death. So his uh, uh, thinking history website has some really great resources on this and it really gets people thinking about all different aspects of life. Um, so, I make explicit links to, uh, made to what Frank Pan is arguing as well. And then we look at how much we agree with Frank Pan in terms of his catalyst for social and economic change, opposed to evaluating. So how much we are agreeing. So I wouldn't say we're evaluating and saying, because I, I really can't fathom the idea of uh, the year seven saying, actually, you know what? Frank Pan, who, who wrote this book over many years and research for years and years, uh, it is wrong because at the end of the day, I really wanted to show them the process of the historian and looking at what how Frank what Frank Pan arguments is using rather than and using letting pupils make up their minds about how much they agree with him rather than saying if they agree with him. 
And then this this sixth lesson about what's the evidence for the impact of the Black Death, I just thought Frank Pan brings in so much amazing different evidence types. And I am very much a, um, with medieval sources, I'm very much a chronicle sort of person, I, well, as in not like that's the only thing I'll use, but they're much not my favourite and my go-to. The story, I mean, I love the medieval stories, I think, and the songs, the, story, uh, the sagas, those sorts of things. Um, and he brings in so many different evidence types, and I really wanted to op uh, expose my pupils to that. Um, so I use all the evidence, sort of loads of pieces of evidence that Frank, from Frank Pan's book, linked to statements he makes to show the historical process. So people as a task or you know, challenge to make the links between what type of evidence is saying what, and you know, great evidence, like um, I think, it, uh, I might be saying this wrong, but the Asiat region of Egypt, where 90% of the taxpayers um, die, or how real wages increase using, um, I, think, I think it comes from priests' accounts and what they're able to buy, you know, as Claire was talking about, that purchasing power increase in the later 14th century. Uh, and archaeology in London, I just thought, it, wow, it really did bring in all the sort of the different evidence types that historians use. Um, so we've talked a lot about sources in year seven, and now we get a real chance to look at all these different pieces of evidence that help help pupils to, or help historians to reconstruct the past, because I'm really keen on helping pupils understand how history is that process, History isn't one, there's not one history, there's different interpretations of the past, depending on what different types of evidence you use. And actually, if we just use one chronicle, um, which have their li major limitations anyway, they probably won't be able to build up a full picture of the past. So I love being, being able to give them those um, bits of uh, evidence to use uh, to link back to what Frank Pan is arguing and it does bring out a little bit more about the impact of the Black Death as Claire was saying like people can spend more on, uh, on what they want so there's a, an, an increase in um, textile uh, demand in northern Europe and actually um, how that in how the trade links with the Silk Road impacts the textile industries in the Middle East and North Africa and I thought that was mind-boggling and I just it just really does make that story more fleshed out it, it made it far more interesting i thought personally than just focusing on britain um because i found it quite dull when we just focused on britain and then we get to sort of the takeaway how did the black death prove to be a catalyst for social and economic change so this is really um this would be assessed um and it's inspired by the work partly of james ellis in teaching history 178 about change visuals now we can use the narrative to find where those big changes come so um pupils look at or they revise or revisit what life was like before the Black Death, what changes come during, and then what life looks like uh, as a result of the Black Death in terms of the social and economic changes. And so their final outcome activity is to answer the EQ through a narrative focused on change. So I really want to build in that um, idea of narrative, which um, personally I've done reading on, but never really done much about. So building in this idea of narrative, um, just so people are really good at focusing and actually the last couple of issues of teaching history have really focused on this idea of narratives um, and constructing accounts really well and they've been a real help for me there so my final thoughts i'm hoping that the focus on historical process and the discipline will make the topic more rigorous that's what i really set out to do i'm really wanting to challenge year seven from the very get-go i hope the greater emphasis on the people uh, the black death affected will hopefully take away the element of silly old people um, these are real people and sort of you know they had their they had we have so much in common with the people of the middle ages i think like humor which is where the pictures come in um humor everyday life you know they, they felt the same fear you know i was i was thinking last night um how there is i, I do have just a sense of anxiety during this pandemic um over the last few months and just thinking a few months ago, I didn't have that. And actually, we, we, we have been very lucky to live in such a time in this country where we don't often feel anxious constantly about things that are going on in the world and actually how we have that in common with um, the people of the Middle Ages. And I, I really want to take away that idea of they're just silly people. They, they were uneducated. I really wanted to take away that misconception. And I really believe, follow it still through like this, that medieval history deserves serious attention at Key Stage 3, um, which... Again, is is not highlighted well by uh, manuscript evidence like this, where you have dogs on rabbits jousting. Although it's amazing, um, 
the manuscript I love looking at manuscripts if you google funny medieval manuscripts you'll have a whale of a time for a good 20 minutes I reckon um, despite it being carried out, out by the most junior of our historians in year seven generally speaking sometimes medieval history goes into year eight I'm aware but for us it stays in year seven and I, I really want to give them that serious approach I, I really disliked the previous black death topics I taught to the point where I didn't like teaching it but mainly it was because I saw it was it was very superficial and it focused on the Black Death comes to England. Here's what here's the silly things they tried to do. They didn't have the context of medieval medicine, nor the context of what life was like. And then they're looking at the impact of it. And a lot of the time, the answers I got from pupils were a lot of people died. And the humanity of the people of the Middle Ages is taken away. And this this is a huge moment for well the world it changes it a lot um and hopefully i hope hopefully i hope that the greater evidential thinking throughout this uh unit um will improve the historians who i teach you, you can find that all the resources that i plan for it um on a shared google drive which you can find on my pinned twitter tweet um, I'm really keen to ha have any thoughts back as well. As I said, I haven't had a chance to teach this to anyone. Um, so I'd love to hear your feedback as well. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it back over to Sam. Thank you very much. I think there's been some questions coming in, uh, but I just, just had a question, uh, Richard. I think the, the way that you're, you're planning to, or have planned to use the, the wealth of different types of evidence that Frank Pan employs is, is fantastic. I guess I found or have struggled in the past sometimes when there is such a complexity of evidence that being is being used, how I kind of enable the students to engage with, with that um, mm. in terms of it, it, it it's sometimes the, com the complexity makes it, especially for perhaps lower ability students. Difficult. So I just wondered how are you planning or how have you planned to kind of support students with that and, and overcome those sorts of barriers? So I guess in reality, I'm using what Frank Pan has done. So that, that sort of, is it, I guess to some extent it could be seen as a simple exercise, but that match up of what different evidence can tell us and trying to find what Frank Pan claims from different pieces of evidence. So um, in particular, we, we look at um, sort of, or uh, something specific. Um, how um, nine? You know that, as I said in the in uh, when I was talking, how about ninety percent of the taxpayers of the Asiat region of Egypt, and that we have chronicle ev and there's a bit about there's a piece of chronicle evidence which talks about how the road between Cairo and Mecca is littered with human bodies, and then Peter Frankopan is obviously arguing that the Middle East was just as affected. So we try and make that link and actually think, and then we think critically. Ah, so Frankopan has made that interpretation he's made that claim using a wealth of evidence um to back up what he is saying so i think as it can we can both challenge the, the very top but also as you say it is it can be difficult giving a whole load of evidence over to sort of lower attainers to show actually i'm not asking you to make your own interpretation as the past here we do that in plenty of other units i'm asking you to make the link between what Frank Pan has argued and his evidence choices. I think that's really a really interesting approach to actually talk about why they've selected that particular yeah. evidence. I think that's really interesting. Um, and it's actually something that Arthur, who's with us today, um, I know has spoken about a lot in regards to construction of interpretations. Um, yeah, I can't take credit for everything. <laughs> and none of us can, let's be frank. Um, we're uh, we're all on the uh, on the coattails of others. Um, no, yeah. I think that's a really interesting approach. Um, it's really good. Uh, a couple of questions that have come in. So one from uh, Danilo. Uh, in your Silk Road sequence, how much do you think maps should or could play a major role to help young children understand the broader world beyond beyond England? Mm. So, so oh, how, I, how important are they? Do you think? I think they're so important. Um, I grew up loving. The Lord of the Rings as a kid and Tolkien's world and all I used to do is look at these maps because mm. they showed me that how places interrelated with each other um, I think they're so important so my my I've got massive maps in my classroom um, 
thankfully I didn't need to buy them. They were just hanging around. The geography department have loads of maps always. And um, I wanted, and they were so surprised when I asked them, can I borrow these maps and put them up in my classroom? I thought, why not? I need, I need maps to show people where history took, uh, show the people's where it took place. So maps feature quite heavily in, in, in my resources to show them actually I mean, and what i love to show them is that england is on the periphery in the middle ages england was so it was such a backwater i think as some historians have argued it that you know we were so insignificant and you know if you look and also i love looking at the size of kingdoms and in the, in the western in western europe during the middle ages and then if you look at sort of the great asian empires and kingdoms and caliphates they are so much bigger in proportion because europe just sort of is it doesn't really matter at that time we think we're so uh, dominated by this idea of sort of a more uh, mo early modern and modern perception of Europe being the center of the world that we forget that during the Middle Ages North Northwestern Europe just didn't really matter so I like m taking them away using maps especially and showing that the Silk Roads are very far removed from England yet we're still trying to connect with them as much as possible so I said my resources feature maps a lot and I'll often go to the back of my room where my maps are and just sort of point at them and show them where these different places are. Um, sort of as Frank Pan wanted from his book where he talks about his map at the very start. So um, yeah, maps, are, they're integral, I think, to the teaching of this world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Um, I'm gonna, and on that, I'm gonna set you off on, on another question and then I'm actually gonna go and get a book, uh, which everybody should go out and get, it's fantastic. So bear with me. Um, so, uh, last question, I think, uh, at the moment, uh, what is England's relationship to the Silk Roads in the medieval period? And I guess, you know, obviously you're not Frank and Pan, which I expect you to no, yeah. answer, but from your reading, what, what is England's relationship with the Silk Roads? And I'll be back. Um, so I'm from, I'm from Southampton. So I've done a lot of sort of just little bits of research here and there and actually, um, we've got lots of uh, trade buildings and wall trade, especially from the 14th century. But just by reading the Silk Roads and getting a better understanding of Southampton's part to play in that, because I do love a little bit of local history as well. Um, how there were, we, you know, we've got evidence in Southampton for sort of um, fine silks and um, powders and dyes that come from the Near East. Um, so England's relationship is, yeah, I mean, the Silk Roads is, is all, not purely a trade. Idea, I, d I mean, obviously, as Frank Pan argues, that it's it's the root on which ideas, religions, um, science, and and trade spreads. But um, I'd really be keen to say that England's relationship with the Silk Roads is mainly mainly to do with trade. So, in, in getting involved with that, um, I guess you could say the ideas as well. I suppose during the uh, after the Third Crusade, when the first English king goes uh, on it, and then sort of changes in, ar in architecture. Um, but trade especially, trying to get involved in this global network um, and sharing ideas. But other than that, because it is so far removed, it cannot access it um, brilliantly well, which is then, in, as Frank Van argues, in the later sort of like 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, Britain is so keen to sort of control these trade routes because they know how powerful they are. And I guess they know how, what it's like to be excluded from them. And I, and I guess as well, in, in that links in so well with, I know it's something that people are very aware of at the moment with Mansa Musa and the empire in yeah. and the, the kind of the, the salt trade or the, the, the salt road there obviously is intrinsically linked with that. I think that's really interesting, isn't it? 